The unfamiliar patron sidled up to the bar, settling onto a stool and requesting a draft beer. It was a quiet afternoon, affording the bartender some respite from the usual hustle. Pausing from wiping down the bar, the stranger broke the silence. Hey, ever seen this guy? He flashed his phone, displaying a somewhat grainy image evidently snapped of another picture. As incentive, he slipped a $20 bill onto the counter. The bartender scrutinized the photo, pinching to zoom in until the face came into focus, albeit a bit blurred. Hmm, might ring a bell. Why the interest? He wasn't about to fit for anyone, yet divulging information about a potential acquaintance required justification. The stranger met the bartender's gaze thoughtfully, opting for candor. His name's David Howard. He's my brother-in-law. My sister, his wife, has been on the hunt for him for ages. They had a falling out, and he vanished out of the blue. We were partners in a business venture, and I only got wind of trouble when he left me a voicemail, urging me not to reach out. Since then, she and I have been scouring for any trace of him. The individual I once knew, who could possibly be the same David, appears much older than depicted in that photo. How long has he been absent? He's been gone for about five years now. The photo was taken a few years before our falling out. The bartender resumed polishing the bar's surface. So, what transpired? Why did he suddenly depart? The stranger shrugged. I wish I could tell you. David and I were roommates and classmates in college, and I considered him my best friend, at least from my side. We were both studying construction management. He met my sister, Stacy Carter, through me, and they began dating. He paused and sighed. I cautioned him not to treat my sister casually, and to my relief he didn't. In fact, she had to ask me to step back when things progressed to a physical level. He finished his beer and signaled for another draft. The bartender obliged and the stranger continued. By the way, my name is Henry Carter. David and I graduated, worked in different construction sectors for a few years, then joined forces to build homes. I managed the framing crews while David handled the finishing touches. From the start, we were a success. Both of us had a touch of obsession when it came to construction. I ensured the concrete was properly cured and the structure was sound, while David meticulously finished every detail. He insisted on flawless seams and invisible joints in the woodwork. His craftsmanship was impeccable, from stair railings to countertops. We never received any complaints about our workmanship. Doors closed smoothly, floors were perfectly level, whether it was a modest cottage or a luxury mansion. Our reputation grew, and we had orders lined up for the next decade. Clients were willing to wait for us to bring their dream homes to life. He paused, taking another sip of his beer. David and Stacy tied the knot before we ventured into business together. They appeared to be the epitome of a happy couple. Hell, Nicole, and I aspire to that level of happiness. But then David changed abruptly. While his work remained top-notch, he withdrew from the camaraderie of the crew. No more post-work beers, no more trips to the bowling alley. Stacy insisted she had no clue what was troubling him. He even started pulling away from her. Then, out of nowhere, he vanished. Stacy had intended to share the news of her pregnancy with him, but never got the chance. Now she's a single mother to an almost five-year-old girl. The child has never met her father, but I believe David is aware of her existence. He retains a lawyer who sends money every month through an untraceable online service. Stacy has to provide receipts for expenses before the lawyer releases any funds. The bartender nodded as Henry ordered another beer, which promptly arrived in front of him. By the way, what's your name? I'd rather not discuss personal matters without knowing who I'm speaking to. The bartender chuckled. My name's Samuel, but most folks around here call me Sammy. Well, Sammy, pleased to make your acquaintance. Now do you recognize this man? Mr. Carter, there's a resemblance, but the David I knew, just David, no last name, looked noticeably older than the fellow in the photo. His hair was graying, and he sported a mustache. When he first arrived in town, we were recovering from a brutal hailstorm, and he was part of a crew replacing roofs, windows, and siding. At some point, he stumbled upon some discarded chairs, which he didn't just fix but restore to their former glory. 
After that, locals began bringing him damaged antiques to restore. Last I heard, he had a backlog of work stretching at least a year ahead. Henry nodded thoughtfully. He was starting to show that side back home too. I remember when someone mentioned throwing out some mid-19th century chairs, David nearly lost it. He educated the owner on the historical significance of the furniture, explaining how they likely traveled across the country in covered wagons because their original owners refused to part with them. He told the owner it was disrespectful to destroy such a piece of history just because they needed repairs, emphasizing the value they would hold once restored. He paused to take a sip of his beer, chuckling. You know, he did such a fantastic job restoring those chairs that the owner immediately put them up for auction and made a tidy sum. Sammy couldn't help but ask, did that upset this David guy that the owner sold them? Henry shook his head. Hell no. David just figured the new owners would appreciate and care for the chairs properly. He simply went back to work, doing what he does best. Taking a long pull from his beer, Henry continued, Now, tell me, Sammy, did David confide in you or anyone else here in town about why he went on the run? I just can't wrap my head around it. I've racked my brain trying to understand what happened. Did I do something wrong? Stacy's been going through the same thing. Our families have all been trying to piece it together. Sammy shook his head in return. The David who came here was quiet and reserved. He'd stop by for a beer after work and then be off. Every so often, the guys would convince him to join in a game of pool or darts, but that was about it. Even the ladies tried to tempt him, but he'd just point to his wedding ring and shake his head. He paused, reflecting on the past. You know, he arrived here about a year back. Initially, some troublemakers attempted to provoke him just to gauge his reaction. They failed miserably until one evening, when one of them crossed the line by groping Emma Johnson, and she wasn't having any of it. By the time the police arrived, three of them were nursing various injuries on the floor. David barely broke a sweat and emerged unscathed. He nearly faced arrest, but Emma and the crowd kicked up such a fuss that the charges were dropped. Those three haven't shown their faces here since. They don't even bother to check if Dave is around, they just steer clear and find another place to cause trouble. As Sammy wiped down a glass, he inquired, By the way, how did you manage to trace this David character to our little town? We're quite off the beaten path. With a chuckle, Henry revealed a secret to Sammy. David always leaves a small mark or brand on any furniture piece he repairs. A new resident in our town was giving us a tour of his house during a housewarming party, and I happened to comment on a particularly fine secretary desk. He proudly shared its history, how he discovered it in an old barn and had it expertly restored. He couldn't stop raving about the craftsman who revived it and where he found it. That's when I checked the back and found David's mark. It led me here. I hope he's still around, but I've pursued other leads before, and he's usually moved on by the time I catch up. Once, I missed him by just a few days, but typically, he's been gone for several months. He gave Sammy a hopeful glance. So, is there a chance David's still around? Sammy continued to polish a glass, appearing to ponder deeply. Well, I haven't seen him around here for a few weeks. You might want to ask around. Someone might have spotted him. He tends to keep to himself. He's got an old beat-up pickup and a sizable trailer where he keeps his tools. He could be out at one of the outlying ranches, working on something, and not have the time to swing by for a drink. Setting down the glass, Sammy leaned on the bar. Now forgive me for prying, but why exactly are you looking for him? Hasn't his wife divorced him for abandonment? Wouldn't she then be entitled to half the business, leaving you to carry on? Henry remained unfazed. It's a bit more complicated than that. When we drew up our partnership agreement, we included clauses to safeguard the business in case of divorce. So, my sister would have to take legal action to force us to sell the business and split the proceeds. Without David present, I couldn't sell even if I wanted to. His attorney has a limited power of attorney, so he can't authorize any sale or modification of the agreement. He motioned for another beer and took a sip as it landed in front of him. When it comes to divorce, we've encountered the same issue. After about a year, Stacy filed for divorce as she had begun seeing someone new. 
They went to court, and the judge ruled that since David was consistently sending money, it didn't constitute abandonment. Just because David couldn't be located for the serving of papers wasn't sufficient grounds for divorce. We hired a private investigator in a last-ditch effort to find him, but it turned out to be a costly and fruitless endeavor. It wasn't until I stumbled upon the occasional piece of furniture that David had restored that we had any luck. Sometimes Stacy and Amanda, his daughter, pursue leads, but most of the time, I'm the one traveling. However, sightings of David have been few and far between over the years. Henry took another sip of his beer, trying to maintain his composure, though the alcohol was starting to cloud his judgment. I know it sounds selfish, but I also want to find David and implore him to return. I can't find anyone else with his level of attention to detail and skill. While I'm still managing, it's not at the same level as when David was handling the finishing work. His expression grew solemn. Have you heard the story of the small church in the desert that lacked stairs to the choir loft? Sammy shook his head. Well, this church was completed without access to the loft. No one knows why. Perhaps the choir used a ladder given the limited space for a staircase. There were efforts to find a carpenter to install stairs, but either there was no interest or no funds. The idea languished until one day, an old man with a donkey and a few tools appeared. He asked for no payment but requested complete solitude to do his work. When he finished, he and his donkey vanished back into the desert. The staircase he created is a marvel of craftsmanship and engineering, made entirely of wood without any visible support. Each step wins elegantly, and each stringer is carved from a single piece of wood. No one knows where the wood even came from. Henry leaned back. That's the kind of craftsman David is, and I want him back. The dialogue continued as Henry questioned other patrons about David. Unfortunately, none could provide any useful information. They all recalled the quiet man with graying hair and a mustache. Some mentioned that their David would go a couple of weeks without shaving, resulting in a salt and pepper beard. Henry seemed doubtful, insisting that his friend and brother-in-law was always meticulous about his appearance. His hair was kept short, and he was consistently clean-shaven, even after long nights working on furniture. After ordering and devouring a large cheeseburger with fries for supper, Henry approached the evening crowd with similar inquiries. Yet, no one could confirm if David had moved on, and no recent sightings were recalled. A few patrons even left the bar briefly to check, reporting back that David's pickup truck and trailer were missing from the last spot that they remembered seeing them. Henry remained until last call, before being assisted to the nearest motel for some much-needed sleep. He had consumed a considerable amount of beer throughout the afternoon and evening, anticipating a substantial headache in the morning. Sammy couldn't shake the feeling that Henry wouldn't stick around for long, especially after confessing his need to return home and complete some housing projects. With the housing market beginning to decline, he couldn't afford to have capital tied up in unsold houses, especially those lacking David's renowned finishing touches. After locking up, Samuel poured a couple of beers and set them on the bar. A slender, older gentleman emerged from the kitchen and settled in front of one of the brews. Samuel initiated the conversation in hushed tones. You caught all of that. The older man, with a stooped posture and an aura of weariness, nodded. Suddenly, he straightened up, shedding years right before Samuel's eyes. It was as if he was casting off a heavy burden. I don't understand why they continue to search. Sure, the partnership agreement poses a challenge, but it's not like he's sending money to a stranger. It's his sister, for heaven's sake, not mine. She's entitled to her share of the profits, profits that would rightfully belong to me whether I was involved or not. You know, David, you've never disclosed the full story to me or anyone else in our small town. Why not unburden yourself for once? The bartender-client confidentiality will be upheld. No one will hear a word of what you confide in me. David shrugged. Perhaps you're right. I've kept silent for over five years. I suppose it's time to share with someone. He let out a heavy sigh and took a sip of his beer. Well, to start with, I've always had a passion for working with wood. My grandfather gave me a whittling knife when I was just a kid and taught me how to carve. Every time I stayed with him, 
we'd sit together and uncover the hidden wonders within a block of wood. Sammy raised an eyebrow. What do you mean by what was hidden in it? David chuckled. Well, each piece of wood has its own character. You might begin with a specific idea in mind, but sometimes the grain doesn't cooperate. So, you're faced with a choice. Either discard the piece or work with the wood to uncover its true potential. Sometimes I'd set out to carve a bird and end up with something entirely different, like a car or a snake. There was even a time when I intended to carve a simple penguin and wound up with an eagle with majestic outspread wings. Grandpa would critique each piece. Some ended up in the fireplace, but most were oiled up and displayed on the shelf. I visit that old cabin every year or so, hoping to find some of his peace within me. David took another sip. Every year, we craft wooden cars, trucks, and trains for those in need. Wooden dolls didn't seem to bring much joy to little girls, so I started making dollhouse furniture, sometimes for 12-inch fashion dolls. I still do that come Christmas time. Samuel nodded, recalling the gifts in the community box last Christmas. While no one knew for certain where they had come from, he and a few others had their suspicions. I was convinced you were behind those toys. We hadn't seen anything like them for years, and even then, they weren't as meticulously crafted as yours. David shrugged nonchalantly. It's just something I enjoy. I spend my evenings in the trailer, carving away. The wood sort of guides me, and I just chip away until something emerges. Samuel couldn't help but shake his head. It was hard to fathom that the intricate carvings were merely the result of removing the unnecessary bits. Oh, and about that staircase story Henry mentioned. It's true, but I'm nowhere near as skilled as he made it out to be. That was a fluke, really. They still can't figure out what wood was used, let alone how it was crafted, David added, taking another sip before continuing. I guess deep down, I always knew I'd end up in construction. There's not much demand for a wood carver these days with all the machinery and CNC technology. Machines can do far more precise work for a fraction of the cost, bending the wood to their will. I couldn't charge anywhere near enough to compete, even with the quality I put into my finished work. He sighed deeply. College was my pathway to understanding the business side of construction. I already had the skills from my high school apprenticeship. All I lacked was the knowledge of how to turn it into more than just a means to earn a living. Henry and I crossed paths when fate made us roommates. Since our hometowns weren't too far apart, we often shared rides home during holidays and breaks. It was on one of those trips that I first encountered Stacy. She was a high school junior back then, a classic cheerleader type, you know. I was smitten, but I refrained from making any advances until she graduated a year later. When she decided to enroll in the same university as us, we made sure to introduce her around campus, ensuring she was treated well by everyone, especially the fraternity boys. We both took on the role of protective big brothers. Despite my desire to date her, I made myself wait until she had the chance to explore life a bit more. After a brief pause, he continued his tale. Then, during her freshman year, one night, she confronted me, demanding to know when I planned to ask her out. She'd grown tired of waiting. That's when we officially became a couple, and we've been inseparable ever since. After I graduated, I found a construction job in the same town as our alma mater to stay close to her. We shared a cozy apartment just off campus until she completed her teaching degree. Samuel couldn't resist asking. And what about Henry? Well, we had extensive discussions about our future partnership, but we knew we needed to establish our reputations first. Henry headed back to his hometown and landed a job with a major company as a framer. He worked on both commercial and residential projects, gaining valuable experience and swiftly rising to become a crew supervisor. Meanwhile, I followed a similar path with a smaller company, focusing on finish work. On the commercial side, my boss initially wasn't thrilled with my meticulous attention to detail, thinking it slowed things down. However, once he realized that our clients weren't lodging complaints about shoddy workmanship, he eased off. David shook his head, recalling the next part of the story. After Stacy graduated, we tied the knot and relocated to her hometown. Since it was just an hour's drive from there to my own hometown, my parents weren't too upset about me not returning home immediately. 
My grandfather was still alive, and his small cabin was only a couple of hours' drive away. Stacy loved visiting there, immersing herself in nature while Grandpa and I spent time carving. I was truly content. Our married life was fulfilling in every way. We were adventurous, exploring different aspects of intimacy to discover what we enjoyed. And there wasn't much we didn't like. But things started to unravel when I got the urge to delve into furniture restoration. Samuel's raised eyebrow prompted another question. So, what happened with Henry and the company? Henry and I took the leap and started our own company, just as we planned, David began. Things started off slow as we built some speculative houses, but the new owners were thrilled with our workmanship. Word of mouth spread, and before long, we had a steady stream of work lined up for years. Then, there was this guy who tried to toss out some antique dining chairs. You know what's the weakest link in a dining set? Shaking his head, Samuel replied, the chairs. Tables can take more punishment than chairs. As the chairs deteriorate, it becomes increasingly difficult to find matching replacements. Too many people don't realize the value of those remaining chairs and just toss them instead of repairing or restoring them. Sometimes it's something as simple as a rung or a leg that renders the chair unusable and it ends up in the trash. This guy, who had just bought one of our homes and was singing praises about our craftsmanship, was dragging the chairs to the curb as we spoke. I pleaded with him to let me fix them, and after some persuasion, he agreed. Once I restored them, he sold the whole set for a premium. It didn't bother me much because someone else would cherish and use that set for many years. Suddenly, I found myself in a new career, and it took off. I was working every evening and most weekends just to keep up. Stacy supported me at first, but she started complaining about the lack of us time, even though every customer praised my restoration work. Samuel poured another beer for David, who nodded his thanks before continuing. We had discussed having children, but as our personal life deteriorated, it became less of a priority. I spent more and more time in the workshop just to avoid arguments. Looking back, I realized I was wrong. I thought I was helping people and still being the partner Henry needed. I couldn't understand why Stacy wasn't in my corner. She started going out in the evenings. The first time I confronted her about it, she yelled back that she wasn't going to sit alone at home every night, wondering if I'd ever call it a day. After my grandfather passed away, I didn't even take weekends off anymore. We were just fighting all the time. Even a trip to the grocery store turned into a battleground as we refused to compromise on anything, not even the brand of milk. Sammy felt compelled to ask the burning question. What led you to leave so abruptly? David took another sip before responding. It wasn't sudden at all. The moment I knew it was over was when the power went out while I was finishing up a house. We didn't have a backup generator. I had sent the rest of the crew to another site to do some sanding and painting while I worked on the trim. I require ample light to make precise cuts and fit them seamlessly together, so I decided to call it a day early and maybe give my wife some attention for once. It was summer, and she wasn't teaching, so she should have been home. And she was just not alone. I found her in bed with the high school football coach. He was still in great shape from his NFL days, but I gave him a beating before tossing him out of my house. He paused, then took a deep breath and continued. Stacy pleaded for my forgiveness. She ranted about how I had emotionally neglected her, so she sought companionship, which escalated into a full-blown affair. She claimed she didn't love him, but it was all excuses. I moved into the small apartment behind my workshop, and at her insistence, we pretended publicly that we were still happily married. I hoped we could salvage things, but I made backup plans just in case. I started putting my earnings from furniture restoration into an account she couldn't access. I also told her that our business with Henry was struggling a bit, and I diverted some of those earnings into the furniture account. It worked for a while until she brought it up at a family gathering, and Henry inadvertently undermined me by denying any business slowdown. Why didn't you just divorce her? Sammy inquired. I looked into it, David replied but she could force the sale of the business to claim her share of my stake, which would hurt Henry. Without children, we'd have to sell the house and the workshop to divide assets evenly. I'd have to start over elsewhere with my side hustle. 
Then I overheard her telling her boyfriend on the phone that she might be pregnant and would name me as the father, either tying me down for good or demanding hefty child support. That's when I revisited our partnership agreement, set up my attorney with power of attorney, and a spending account for the baby. I left behind my wedding ring, cell phone, and new pickup, and simply walked away. I knew I could find work in construction almost anywhere. I didn't bother changing my identity or hiding too well, I just moved from town to town. With such a vast country and countless people, if you're cautious and avoid drawing attention, you can blend in for years. What about the branding on the furniture? Isn't that a risk? Sammy pressed. David shrugged. It's a small risk. Most of the furniture I restore stays local. There's no shipping involved since I'm not buying and selling. Occasionally, someone who moves away might praise my work, but if I move a short distance, the risk decreases. I'm truly humbled that no one here tonight exposed me. Even though many have seen me recently, they've all silently agreed to stick with your story that I've been absent for some time. No one even informed Henry of my whereabouts. They simply confirmed my absence. In fact, I've rented an old warehouse on the outskirts of town, and my rig is parked inside. I walk wherever I need to go. If Henry sticks around long enough, I'll have to make a decision whether it's time to move on. But with interest rates on the rise and the housing market showing signs of flattening, I doubt he can afford to stay and even investigate any gossip he might hear. Unless he's been diversifying his investments beyond real estate, he needs to finish and sell houses as quickly as possible. I hope he can weather this inflationary period, and I also hope interest rates drop again soon. I harbor no ill will toward him, but even if I were there, it might not make much of a difference. What about your wife and child? Sammy asked. Regarding the child, she's not mine, despite what the birth certificate says. Stacy and I hadn't been intimate for some time before I caught her in bed with her boyfriend. She knows it, but she's kept it a secret because her parents are staunchly conservative and fundamentalist Christians, favoring the Old Testament over the New. That's why she hasn't publicly disclosed the reason for my departure. My attorney keeps me updated. Stacy is afraid to date or even go out with friends to avoid disappointing her parents. Her boyfriend actually left town a couple of years ago to pursue other interests. Maybe my influence played a role in his decision. My attorney assures me that as long as I continue making reasonable child support payments, the judge won't grant her divorce petition. Since the judge shares similar beliefs and is connected to my in-law's church and happens to be my attorney's uncle, I don't foresee any changes in the status quo for a while. I stopped making payments on the house, but she can't sell it, so she has to scrape by to keep a roof over her child's head. Surprisingly, my in-laws aren't aware of my role in the marriage's breakdown. I sent them a letter after leaving town, informing them of Stacy's infidelity and asking them not to reveal their knowledge to her. Taking some responsibility for the marriage's failure, I send them money to lend to her to keep up with the house payments. In 10 years, the house will be paid off. Samuel persisted. Aren't you being cruel to your wife? You've essentially trapped her, preventing her from moving on. How long do you plan to punish her? Samuel, let me pose a question to you, David countered. Have you ever seen me with another woman? Since discovering my wife's infidelity, I've been serving the same penance as her. If I ever develop feelings for someone else, I'll instruct my attorney to forward the divorce papers and set her free. Until then, or until she confesses her sins to her parents and decides to move on with someone else, we're both stuck in this purgatory. The realization dawned on Samuel, evident in his expression. You still love her, don't you? David nodded solemnly. That's my burden. Despite all the years of toiling away, washing dishes, cooking, doing construction, and despite what she did to me, I still love and desire her. I refuse to denigrate her, even after her betrayal. I may be labeled a cuckold or a pushover, but that doesn't change the fact that I still hold love for her. Why not swallow your pride and return home? Accept the child as yours and reclaim your life? Sangmo suggested. A few times a year, I'll send her an email from a disposable account. Her responses are usually filled with anger towards me. Never once has she apologized for her actions. She shows no remorse. 
She's tried to guilt me by saying our child misses her daddy, but I shut that down by threatening to reveal the truth about the child's paternity to her family and friends. Although she signs off with declarations of love, her messages betray her words. She's unrepentant, and we both continue to suffer. David finished his drink. I'm not happy, but I'm not unhappy either. I make enough to get by, albeit frugally. I send money back for Amanda's care and save for the future. I'm content. Even if Henry were to return now and try to force me back, he wouldn't succeed. That's one of the freedoms of living in a free society. You have obligations like taxes, but no one can force you to live where you don't want to. I'm free to assist after a storm and then move on. I'm free to restore antique furniture and free to find love again if I choose. David rose from the bar. Good night, Samuel. May peace be with you. Perhaps we'll meet again, or perhaps not. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.